All right, let's see if that did it. Let me know if you can see or hear me, everybody. Hopefully it's both. Uh, let's see, waiting on a response. All right, does that mean I'm on? <laughs> Somebody be explicit in their message, please. All right, beautiful. All right, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. It's really good to have you here. A little bit late today, but that's because we're setting up a special stream. Uh, this is our second to last day digging in the quarry. So Jim thought we should uh, talk a little bit about the local geology here. And so we're both excited to uh, take in a little tour through the earliest Cretaceous here in eastern Utah and uh, should be a lot of fun. Um, of course, we've got Utah State Paleontologist Jim Kirkland over here and I'm Danny Anduza, paleontologist from California. And we've been out here for almost three weeks now. Actually, no, it is. Today's day 22. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Before we uh, head back to civilization in a couple days, Figured be this is a figured this would be a great opportunity to take a look at some of these strata. There's Jim there. Oh, certainly, and we got a little bit hazier than we would like. Yeah, but <laughs> at least it's not as hot as it normally is this time of day, so that's yeah. a plus. We got some wildfire smoke or something. Yeah, there's some fires over Beaver, but you know, yeah, bit 150 miles due west. Gotcha. That's why it yeah, smells smoke, so smoky. Yeah, the smoke yeah. blowing in here. Yeah. But we've had a pretty clear year, so can't yeah. complain. We've been lucky so yeah. far. This is the first real smoke we've gotten. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Shoot, do you want to introduce yourself sure. real quick? Yeah. Well, I'm Jim Kirkland. I'm the state paleontologist for Utah with the Utah Geologic Survey. And uh, we are working on Bureau of Land Management land here. This region around here is we call Doling's Bowl. And basically, when you look around, you realize there's kind of a rim around the whole thing. And it's somewhat tilting to the north. And you can see the sandstone of the poison strip member of the Cedar Mountain, basically going all the way around this area. And there's a couple little outlets so water can flow out of, uh -huh. the, out of the bowl. But this bowl has turned out to be a fossil bonanza. It's just incredible. And, and yeah. an a information bonanza in terms of the history of paleoclimate across the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. If we look up at this outcrop right behind us, that big bluff, that sandstone bench on top is the poison strip member of the Cedar Mountain Formation. And the rocks under it, all the way to near the base, it's a little fuzzy, but you might be able to make out some red sandstone in there and some muds. That's the base of the Yellow Cat. It's a gravelly river system in this area. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a paleosol, it can vary. But that whole slope, pretty much, is the Yellow Cat. And right in the middle of the slope, there's a kick, a gray, before it goes into a little reddish tunes. That's the separation between the upper Yellow Cat and the lower Yellow Cat. Mm. And the lower Yellow Cat's what we've been digging in for the yeah, past three the weeks. The upper Yellow yeah. Cat is where we get Utah Raptor nice. and Gastonia Burgi. So we have two faunas, but now we're beginning to think the stack, as I'll show you, the stack of paleosols mm -hmm. may actually reflect a lot more time than the upper yellow cat. Interesting. There's a lot of lacustrine, a lot of lake beds. We get a lot of fish material. Mm -hmm. You know, when we look in, in my weathered slope, you'll see little fish scales coming out, uh -huh. things like that, crocs and turtles. So it's a pretty wet setting, and we think it's because it's an internally draining basin. Right. So water was pond in here quite a bit. Uh-huh. It probably filled in fairly rapidly. So it's probably a million, two million years Shoot. for that Utah Raptor fauna, that real discrete fauna uh -huh. that is only found in Grand County, Utah because right. of salt tectonics. <laughs> you know, this paradox basin area. Uh-huh. But if you look at the very bay bottom on the like the ground floor up there, mm -hmm. there's some gray little hills. That's the Morrison Formation. Oh, we so, can actually see the Morrison see the down gray, there at the base. Gray base that yeah. gray, it's mectitic, uh, mud, that's the Morrison. Uh -huh. Anyway, this river system kind of comes across here and goes under. And basically, we're standing pretty much on the uh, top of that river when we start looking at these rocks over here. Gotcha. This is an ancient river, 140 million years old, just to make, every, make it clear for everybody watching at home. Yeah. Yeah, as we pan around here, you know, you see the bench of the poison strip goes across and into that slope over there. 
The top is actually the Natarita formation, uh. which is the base of the Upper Cretaceous. Uh -huh. So the whole Cedar Mountain here is about 250. Uh, 300 feet thick in this region. So it's about 300, 300 feet thick, but we're talking about like 40 million years. Yeah, well here, we're losing the upper prime. Okay, yeah. We're all in the basal river channel, gra so, you know, gravel. So that was eroded area. away, the whole mustn't touch it was just... It's, yeah, the top, that's only deposited in the Portland Basin uh -huh. on the other side of the San Rafael Swell. Gotcha. About 100 miles from here. Okay. And that's where, uh, is that where Lindsay Zano and co. found that new ornithopod, Iani? Yes, that's where it's from. Yeah, uh, if anybody Eolambia, saw that in the news. Eolambia is from there, and uh -huh. Antarx. Yeah. It's a very distinct fauna because that's the first time Asian animals start coming into North America. Sure. Down here, we're finding animals with European ties, uh -huh. like the iguanodonts and polycanthines. And the, the folks at home are going to want to know how that happens. How do you get European or Asian animals coming into North America? Well, at this time, in the Morrison, too, there's a European connection. Uh -huh. The North Atlantic is ripping, but there's lots of islands. Right. And these things are probably island hopping their way across uh -huh. uh, to get here, because there's no major land bridge we know about, perhaps through Scandinavia, huh. Greenland. It may have still not been completely open. Yeah. But a lot of the best records we have of these animals is the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, Portugal, and of course, right. southern Britain. Uh -huh. uh, but that time we're tied to Europe, and this uh, between the Poison Strip and the Natarita, uh -huh. we're basically an island continent, huh. like of Australia. Yeah. And we have animals that are unique to North America uh -huh. through that time interval of about another 20 million years. Uh -huh. So we have this English-like, you know, European dinosaur fauna, we call yeah. the Wielden style fauna. Uh -huh. And then about 20 million years, what we call the Cloverly style fauna yeah. of the Aptian through Albion. Mm -hmm. When we were an island, and then we get connections with Asia, right? and we get beginnings of the North American late Cretaceous fauna. As tyrann tyrannosaurids yeah. come in, uh -huh. uh, pachycephalosaurs. Hadrosaurs, uh, yeah. Pretty exciting. Well, not proper hadrosaur, hadrosaur form. Gotcha, yeah. But they really replace our yeah. real primitive fillers gotcha. that we get in the Ruby Ranch. Uh -huh. Conosaurus, which is, yeah. You know, very, very primitive animal. Just filled the role of the extinct iguanodons that we have down here. Uh -huh. So let's just walk over and look at these soils. Anybody have any questions here? Yeah, let's see if we got any questions. Uh, we did just get a raid, which is pretty cool. Uh, thank you, raiders, for coming in. Uh, Mr. Rancio, appreciate the raid. Good to have you. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Let me know if you've got any questions for Utah's official state paleontologist, Dr. Jim Kirkland. Um, well, something I'd like to point out yeah. is this, you know, this 250, 300 feet of the Cedar Mountain Formation. Yeah. If you look to the north of the Book Cliffs, uh -huh. as far as the eye can see, it's all Upper Cretaceous. Right. And there's over two miles of Upper Cretaceous uh -huh. preserved there. That represents less time than the Cedar Mountain Formation, and it's 250, 300 feet of thickness. So you've just got a lot more deposition going on during that. Where and this whole valley, the whole flats in between, yeah. is the soft marine muds the of the Cretaceous yeah. Western Interior Seaway. Nice, and nice. Our Manco screw. Uh huh. I wish it weren't so hazy today, Chad, or you could see those the book cliffs over there on the horizon. It's usually pretty spectacular, but. And We're given the dip, you, know, you win a basin in the middle of that is wonderful basal tertiary age of mammals deposits. Ah. But this whole sequence is dipping toward the basin. Uh -huh. So you just think of this whole thing sort of being flat, being slightly canted. Interesting. So because of the angle of dip, it's usually around 13 to 15 miles wide for that valley uh -huh. because of the thickness, almost a mile thick, right. of Manco Shale. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it's a, you know, a mile of marine mud. <laughs> so what kinds of critters would have been swimming around in that in that sea at the time? In that sea, the dominant animals, of course, were mosasaurs. Uh, I mean, the very first mosasaurs seem to appear right at the base of that sequence. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know, mosasaurs are giant marine lizards. They're lizards, and yeah. actually they probably have ties to snakes. Yeah. You know, as close as they do with modern lizards. Uh-huh. But uh, the mosasaurs were big, small pliosaurs, you know, the polycotylids. Uh, yeah. It's always a t tricky name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two, three meters long. They're not uh -huh. huge, but they're real successful. Of course, a variety of sea turtles. Yeah, yeah. You know, huge zephactinus, uh, the largest bony fish. We, well, it's yeah. not the largest. largest one is Bonner Ichthys. Oh, yeah. Which big, is a big filter feeder. Big yeah. filter feeder bony yeah. fish. But zephactinus is like a, they call it a bulldog fish. Think of it like bulldog a... Bulldog tarpon. 
Yeah, it's like a giant tarpon from hell. Yeah, um, scales about that big around on yeah. the big ones. Those critters could get like close to 20 feet long, right? Oh, absolutely. Just, yeah, so picture like a big tarpon the size of a great white shark, basically. Yeah, with yeah. teeth like that. Yeah. <laughs> Nuts, yeah. nuts. They're much, yeah. a much different mouth yeah. than our modern tarpon, but they yeah. look a lot like them in body form. Uh -huh. So if we walk down here, you can see the sands of that river channel. It's like migrating over, and then we start to see the soils built on top of it. Uh -huh. And these soils are real interesting. We see similar soils at the top of the Morrison Formation uh, in certain places, but often it's erosional surface, uh -huh. so that stuff gets cut out. But here we have a record that the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary uh -huh. was very wet. Huh. Not quite rain for, certainly, but much wetter than the overall Morrison environment for the Upper Jurassic. Interesting. And the Cedar Mountain formation from the Upper Yellow Cat up through the Ruby Ranch. Uh -huh. So it was a kind of a special time. Okay, do you think that here. could have something to do with the turnover? Like the fact we, that it was... Well, we think there's, I mean, we basically know there's a turnover. Uh -huh. We don't know the mechanism, what's going on. By turnover, we mean like there's an extinction event. And Major extinction. Do you like, so most of the dinosaurs in this region are going extinct and they're just replaced by something new at the beginning of the Cretaceous. Um, so what caused that, that turnover event, you know, that change in the fauna? So we don't have a record of a big asteroid impact. We don't have a record of major volcanic activity. Uh -huh. We don't know. So that's weird that like, you know, kind of the cast of dinosaur characters in North America just changes about halfway through the age of dinosaurs. But if you start looking at this rock in here, uh -huh. you see the yellow, that's from iron. See all yeah. that dark red blobs? Yeah, that's here. That's ironstone. Ironstone in here. And this is a ferruginous paleosol. So it is rich in iron. Uh -huh. No calcium carbonate, no salts. Mm -hmm. So it shows us that water is coming down through it uh -huh. as opposed to evaporating up into it. So this is, it, it shows that there's a lot of moisture at this time. Yeah, a lot more than we see lower and a lot more than we see higher. Interesting. And it's only in the lower yellow cat because as we got top of the yellow cat is carbonates. Uh -huh. You know, because yeah. the calcrete has the uppermost bed. Uh -huh. But if you look at these beds, you see a characteristic we see in the quarry quite a bit, loaded with gravel. Uh -huh. So you you know kind of zoom in and see all yeah. the, the little gravel in the there. beds, little pebbles. So these would be reworked bits from the Probably Morrison Formation. Yeah, reworked from the Morrison Channel. So these are little way. Jurassic rocks that have been reworked up into Cretaceous well, actually, rocks. they could be Jurassic through Paleozoic rocks. It could be even older. Were, okay. That were in the Morrison that got uh -huh. reworked. Yeah. Because uh, the Morrison has a lot more gravelly river channels uh -huh. than we see in the Cedar Mountain. But you see these gravels, and that's the best way to mark the contact. Uh -huh. You know, unless you have a big river like we have here. Yeah. Or... Uh, uh, you know, a, a kaolinite zone, a white bed. Uh -huh. You know, kaolinite is also a clay that forms under humid, wet conditions. Uh -huh. And it seems to be characteristic of the contact in a number of places. Huh. So everything's telling us wet, but if you got the gravels, mm -hmm. you know, in the muds, right. you know, we can be very comfortable that we're looking at the early Cretaceous. Huh. And in fact, if you look at this red ironstone, you can see on top of it, you know, yeah. blobs of it coming out. Look at that. You know, we do have dinosaur bones in that level. In this? In the ironstone level. Huh. We've got a beautiful ankylosaur shoulder, uh, upper arm, uh -huh. got an iguanodont shoulder blade, but things at that level are more dispersed. Okay. So we can't just start digging. Right. Yeah. Is there any, anything identifiable or no, we got a perfect polycanthus humerus. I'm going to figure in a paper I'm working on. Nice. But we can't name the animal from that. You know? Yeah, it's not diagnostic it's a enough. It's polycanthine. We can take it to its uh -huh. family or subfamily. So you that's, look that's at cool because it. it shows that these animals were here immediately after the end Jurassic extinction. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is basically this wet crisis interval. Uh -huh. And we don't have clue one. I mean, this is, this is research. Uh, you yeah. Got, you got kids, maybe your kids or grandkids are going to figure it out. Right. Because, um, <laughs> you know, it's opened up a big question. We only recently uh -huh. realized that these ironstone beds may be about 142 million. Huh. You know, so they're right near the very base of the Cretaceous. So maybe talk a little bit about who are the critters walking around in the Morrison Formation and what they got replaced by? So people get a sense for like how big a change this is. Of course, most folks are familiar to some degree with the Morrison Faunas, Dinosaur yeah. National Monument. We have a great diversity of long-necked dinosaurs, sauropods, uh -huh. 
big family with many different taxa, like Supersaurus and Barosaurus and Diplodocus mm -hmm. and Apatosaurus, so the Diplodocus mm -hmm. proper. And that whole group goes extinct. Wow. You know, they're like one of the dominant animals. Another group that seems to go extinct are, is the Camarasaurids. Uh -huh. You know, North America and the Morris and the uh, Camarasaurus is our most common dinosaur. Yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah. And we apparently they go extinct. There's a tooth, I think, in the wheel, and one tooth. Hmm. Is they call it Camarasaurus? I looked at the picture and said, that doesn't look like a Camarasaurus tooth. It's a Toriosaur. You know, it's just a broad and it probably yeah. a Toriosaur. But yeah. It could be Brachiosaur as well. Huh. Because there are brachiosaurs in quite high diversity. Uh -huh. In fact, one of the things the uh, Spanish colleagues that work with me are saying is they think our Cedar Mountain, our early uh, brachiosaurs, mm -hmm. aren't descended from brachiosaurus. Oh, they might be. They think they're European tied to European taxa that came huh. over. And of course, you know, we you know we basically lose all the sauropods. If yeah. that's true. Come uh -huh. all of them. You know, and that is such a sauropod-dominated farm. Yeah, that's super and, dramatic. And we lose stegosaurs. Huh. I mean, stegosaurs go into the early Cretaceous mm -hmm. in Europe, Africa, Asia. If I found one here right now in that bed, mm -hmm. it wouldn't kill me. Because, because they're everywhere yeah. in the world still. Yeah. But maybe not in North America. Huh. We have no record of these uh, making it through. Uh -huh. And, of course, among the meat eaters, allosaurids, uh -huh. our state fossil. Yeah. Ceratosaurids, completely out. Huh. Uh, the megalosaurs, were you know, yeah. represented by Torvosaurus. Torvosaurus. They all go out. Uh -huh. None of them here. We're thinking that the next group in are allosauroids, the carcharodontosaurs, uh -huh. and neovenatorids mm -hmm. come in to replace them. Huh. And once again, maybe coming in from Europe. A mm -hmm. um, lot more work to do because that large theropod uh, record here is still pretty scrappy. Right. And well, we've got bits and pieces like I, we do. You showed me that tooth, the yeah. big carcharodontosaur tooth. Oh, yeah, here. teeth, you know, big across as my hand. I yeah. Mean, major size animals were in here, but. We're waiting to find that one that got stuck in the mud. Yeah, we need to find that thing. <laughs> yeah. But these soils here are just really significant. They're wet, mm -hmm. unlike below and unlike above. Yeah. So let's wander around and see a little closer to the yeah. rocks that are rolling down the hill from the top. Sounds good. You can see them all over the surface here. Just grab them. One to bring over the outcrop. That's a good one. Okay. Uh, this is probably solidified peat. Uh -huh. well, let's go over the outcrop. Sure. And we can talk about this stuff a little bit. Oh, Cactus Jack wants to know how deep was this bowl back then? I mean, it wasn't a bowl back then. No, back yeah. then this was the surface. There were ponds. And yeah, this fishes. would have been a big old floodplain, like mostly flat out here. But by the end of the Cretaceous, it was buried two miles deep. <laughs> and then you add about another two miles of early to mid tertiary rocks above that. Uh huh. Before and then that was all eroded away? All later eroded away. Shoot. But yeah, you see some of this beautiful agate that used to be peat. Different environment, this stuff would be altered to form coal, <laughs> lignite. So let's put this up here, just so we can talk about it. Yeah. We see some little thin layers mm -hmm. of that across here. Yeah. See so all these fossil roots uh -huh. that are silicified. When you say silicified, can you explain what Replaced. that means to the folks at home? The wood has been replaced by silica, mm. kind of like a petrified log. You know, here's a nice root coming yeah, out. right there. And they're all through here. Very nice. And if you look at this bed here, uh -huh. that's the chert beds. It's just real thin right here. Uh -huh. it's certainly thicker up there uh, around our quarry. We have spring boils of these things mm -hmm. where it's a meter plus thick. But when you look at this, you get all these cherts and all the roots root root all through here uh -huh. roots of these yeah. ferns coming out of the rock would these be something similar to the tempskia that we've been finding in the quarry certainly huh. and what we see in the quarry uh -huh. are little rounded chunks of root yeah that have been already partly solidified mm -hmm. broken up and then reworked yeah. to the site huh. so this stuff's forming right near the surface right and the silica is coming from volcanic ash down in the Jurassic uh -huh. and work is seeping its way up. Yes. Yeah. Pretty dry out here, <laughs> no <laughs> doubt. But uh, 
this is a pretty deep low outcrop because you know you look here there's just pieces of root all over uh -huh. but then you see the chert beds you know more little roots just roots everywhere uh -huh. roots 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 you know all getting reworked so this is why you say we need some paleobotanists out oh, here there's plant material get. galore and you look at you know like this uh -huh. You know, the top, these are probably roots of something and pressed into the peat. Right. You know, when you see the bedding, uh -huh. you know, this was just pure plant material. Just layers yeah. of fern leaves and, and rootlets and things. Deposits of pure organic carbon. If it was wet, it would turn to coal, uh -huh. you know, with compaction. Yeah. But because of this super saturation of silica uh -huh. from the Jurassic, they, it alters to peat. Yeah. And of course, our Native American friends, uh -huh. you know, that preceded us out here, that was a real important source of tools. Right. These are really good charts. There's lithic sites everywhere here. They were, you know, using these resources, which are crop all the way from Colorado all the way to the San Rafael Swell and in places within the San Rafael Swell uh -huh. between the big basal Buckhorn River. Uh -huh. But uh, we also see, if we look up in the poison strip which mm -hmm. is a sandstone bed is what we but think the top of, of that far edge lakes yeah. in places that stuff alter you know gets cemented really well mm -hmm. and this is quartzite from the poison strip member uh -huh. and this is we use as a tool and you, if you break this stuff it actually breaks through the grain so people go, well that's supposed to be metamorphic uh -huh. well we know it isn't <laughs> it's just so well cemented uh -huh. but this forms a really good tough tool they make axe heads out of this uh -huh. uh, you know mallets you know, and it holds an edge a lot longer than the chert. Nice. You know, if you shoot, shoot that chert and you hit a rock with that arrow, uh -huh. you know, it's just going to shatter. Uh -huh. So they use this for big durable tools like axes for chopping down trees. Gotcha. So there are, along the rim here, there's numerous quarries where, you know, back, you know, you know, you know, uh, you know Native Americans were from this, probably from Clovis Man up. Uh -huh. We're utilizing these kind of things for their, you know, bigger tools. Yeah. You know, mauls, hammers, stones, and axe heads. Huh. You know, things of that. So we have legitimate quarries. Yeah. So people go, well, if the archaeologists, they'll stop you from working. It's like, you know, what gives us the dinosaurs also provided a yeah. major resource for our Native Americans. Uh -huh. And civilization within Native American cultures was developing in Western North America. Uh -huh. So I look at, you know, this whole record's tied together. Yeah. Why do we have these rocks? Rocks here, solid tectonics, uh -huh. arches, it's coming up, cracking to give us the setup for the arches. Yeah. When that goes up, salt's coming in from below, this area subsides mm -hmm. and receives these sediments. Hmm. So what gives us these dinosaurs gives us Arches National Monument. Very cool. Yeah, so it's uh, pretty exciting. But our dinosaur quarry, step over here, port side up here just for now. You look over here, you see all these chert beds coming out. Uh -huh. And that green zone right there? Yeah. That's where all the bones coming out that we're digging. <laughs> Just above the chert level, we get pieces of the chert reworked into it. It's not coming too far. Right. Um, look at the size of that root. Yeah, it's a big old root right there. Yeah. Shoot. <laughs> yeah. But basically, you know, we have that dinosaur level. Mm -hmm. We have the level down at the... Uh, uh, ironstone. There's not ironstone in here, really. Yeah. Uh, fading up, and that up top there is what we call a calcrete. That's calcium carbonate. It's a multi-tiered paleosoil system, uh -huh. and those paleosoils start to indicate that we have a rain shadow beginning from the early mountain building episode of the severe orogeny. Huh. And we're actually because of this and the dates we have, we're actually putting a better date on it. For the beginning of the orogeny than mm -hmm. they had uh, in the past. That's pretty cool. Yeah, we're yeah. about 15 million years earlier. Uh huh. And but we don't get snow on them until about 115 million. And how can we tell uh, that? I know it's a cool story. Yeah. Well, we can tell you are what you eat and you are what you drink. Uh huh. And as as you know, we have stable isotopes in the world today, not radioactive, but yeah. stable isotopes. And oxygen, we have the common O16, mm -hmm. but a heavier one, O18. Mm -hmm. And the O18, you know, the bigger molecule reacts a little slower. So when you're building snow and, and rain as it goes up elevation, you know, it's, it's, it's actually using more O16 
you know, 18 is you go up because it's easier to do things with 068. Sure, okay. So you start concentrating it up in the snow caps of snow capped mountains. Uh huh. Well, dinosaurs are drinking the water down here and have a certain isotope ratio in the enamel of their teeth. Yeah. And a big tooth takes about a year to grow. Mm -hmm. So you do micro sampling of the enamel, look at the oxygen isotopes, mm -hmm. and you can see, oh, there's a flush of O16, and it really shifts the ratio of O18 and O16. So it shows that they're drinking meltwater. Yeah, meltwater is coming down once a year. Yeah. We don't see that in these rocks at all. There is no snow up in the severe hills, uh -huh. right? Hills just screening this area a little bit until the middle of the, uh, well, probably the lower part of the Albion, the last stage of the early uh -huh. Cretaceous. That's super cool. It's some really neat detective work. Yeah, it's, you know, yeah. The, the, the tools we have in our tool belt now mm -hmm. are getting more and more sophisticated. Yeah. And we're really exciting. I mean, the fact that we can look at these soils, mm -hmm. sample for zircons, which give us uranium and lead, yeah. so we can date these rocks. And if you get a volcanic ash coming down on a paleosol, mm -hmm. the zircons are almost indestructible. Yeah. You know, if you're going to fake a diamond, zircon's a good thing to do it with. <laughs> <laughs> but it reworks into the sediment, uh -huh. and it just stays there. So you sample it. If there was an ash associated with that paleo cell, you're going to catch it. You're going to do all these older zircons, and all of a sudden there'll be a little peak at the end, hmm. catching that ash. Uh -huh. And we've done that with a few things in the lower and in the uh, uh, upper yellow cat that have mm -hmm. given us a more robust framework. But we need a lot more dating at all levels hmm. on this stuff. But the tools we have you know, are mi much, much better than we had just 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, it's really exciting. This stuff just keeps moving forward. So all these young, you know, grand students of mine <laughs> are doing stuff that I can barely imagine people could do, you know, back 20 years ago. Uh -huh. You know, and it's, it's exciting because, you know, we're going to know a lot more about this as years go on. Not going to clone a dinosaur, though. <laughs> I just... I think that's beyond us. I'll get my time machine first. Also, go. look at this stuff. You can see the rooting in these paleosols. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> these so, soil features. Can you explain what a paleosol is to the audience? A, pa a paleosol is a scientific name for basically a fossil soil. And, uh, you know, if you say paleo soil, mm -hmm. you know, your colleagues yell at you. <laughs> you need a technical term <laughs> yeah, for that. They yeah, they sol. They drop the eye. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, these ancient soils, depending on if they're iron rich, carbonate rich, uh -huh. tell us about climate. Yeah. And people say, well, how do you know that? Well, since soils are where we get all our food, yeah. <laughs> you know, the soil maps of the world are pretty accurate mm -hmm. and they track different climatic regimes. Right. So you get different types of soils, you know, in different places. Yeah. You know, Georgia red clays are wet soils. You don't get any calcium carbonate in that stuff out mm -hmm. here. Calcium sulfate, calcium carbonate, just leach up to the top in your yeah. front yard. Uh, it's, we're loaded with salt out here hmm. because we have net evaporation. Right, because it's a drier uh, environment. Yeah, and it just wicks up. Uh -huh. and it rains and just wicks it up as it evaporates. Huh. So you start concentrating salts in the soils, like molecules, like each other, so they bond yeah. and create little nodules and things like we see in the calcrete uh -huh. uh, and in those ironstones. They tend, tend to like each other. So yeah, they, yeah. They form little nodules and things. But we can see a climatic shift from very wet or pretty dang wet uh -huh. to fairly dry. Yeah. You know, just within the lower yellow cat. And this stuff may span 10 million years. Holy cow. Uh, yeah. I mean, we got a lot of work to do. Uh -huh. But uh, the fact that we're now seeing across even paleosols within it, uh -huh. uh, different faunas, as we go out to the Crystal Geyser site, mm -hmm. where we found Falcarius, there's kind of an acid etched horizon right mm -hmm. on the top of the bone bed. Mm -hmm. And you can just see the, the carbonates and things that the bones are preserved in are etched and they, they corrode the top and then redeposit the bottom. Huh. What we call pendant structures. Oh. So it's really showing it's just leaching yeah. on the top of that surface for a while. Hmm. And then we have another therizinosaur bone bed above that and we're now pretty comfortable it's a different species. So we got <laughs> Falcarius fauna here uh -huh. and just above it, you know, and we're trying feet. Just above it is yeah. the uh, Gemini Raptor Suarez Orum right. bone bed. So that suggests there's a lot of time in between there if you've it got well one be. species evolving into yeah, another. You have so, two yeah, two therizinosaurs. Yeah. And you know the one we have here uh -huh. is much bigger than either of those taxa. That's interesting. It seems to be if it really is a therizinosaur, more primitive than either. Interesting. So that you know just 
And then we've got another one right at the base of the uh, upper yellow cat above the cow creek. Uh -huh. So it's like four different, there was dinosaurs, mm -hmm. you know, in these rocks. Jeez. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot more primitive of time. than just about anything known in Asia. Yeah, yeah. So how'd they get here to Asia? Through Europe. Huh. It's the only route. So we should expect to find therizinosaurs in Europe at some point. Oh, I, I predict that. Yeah. yeah. We will find some. Very cool. So keep a lookout yeah. for therizinosaurs out yeah. there. Yeah. You'll yeah. see an announcement eventually because they will announce <laughs> it. <laughs> now, we, we did have some questions early on, and I apologize for taking so long with that, viewers. But one of them was, um, it was about about invertebrates i think if there's an invertebrate turnover from the jurassic to the cretaceous um probably there probably is but i'm yeah. not working on that there is a, a turnover in marine reptiles okay and marine crocs right because elas I mean, not elas ichthyosaurs uh see a drop at that time don't they yeah diversity but they yeah. still go on to the, the mid cretaceous yeah extinction yeah but uh, a lot of the marine uh, geosaurs mm -hmm. marine crocs go out yeah, and let's see. Uh, Dr. Diplodocus wants to know, is there a way to identify how old a dinosaur fossil is? Um, I think that's called histology. Exactly. Well, I don't know if he means if he means histology or if he means radiometric dating. But uh, well, yeah, radiometric dating, if you want absolute age of how long ago they were buried. Yeah. If you want to know how old the animal is when it kicked off, yeah. you got to cut open the bones and yeah. have a growth series, really. Yeah. And then once you know that, then you can start plugging in the bigger stuff. And, mm -hmm. Okay, that fits in about here in this growth curve. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then uh, also wants to know if we've got, mo like, any examples of, of, like, Utah raptor evolving through time. And that's actually an excellent question yeah. because we might have very well have. Yeah, there's uh, now a Utah raptor-like animal for sure uh -huh. up in the poison strip. Right. You know, it's the upper yellow cat where originally Utah raptor was found. Yeah. And Yorgovuchia down here is probably mm -hmm. related, uh -huh. but it's a smaller animal. Uh, basically, as I like to say, we probably had an arms race mm -hmm. between them and other animals. You know, you basically uh, have escalation as animals get better armored, better yeah. uh, locomotive abilities, defense structures uh -huh. you become a little smarter. Yeah. Uh, so you get better and better at being a prey animal, get away. Yeah. And you get better and better at being a predator. <laughs> so, you know, we would predict if we had a, uh, one of these new Utah raptor sized predators from mm -hmm. up there, because maybe 10 million years later, yeah. uh, we would expect it to have adaptions that would let it open the, the armored dinosaur because the armored dinosaur up there mm -hmm. is much spinier than Gastonia burgi. Right. So it's getting optimizing defense, uh -huh. and the Utah raptors are probably optimizing can openers. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really cool because it's, you know, to see an armors race in dinosaurs like that is. Uh... That's a pretty neat thing, like to be able to watch these creatures evolve over time. You can only do that through systematic collecting, knowing exactly how old all the rocks are, so you can put them in their proper sequence. Yeah, dude, we're, we're going to be able to ask questions that we would say, well, we'll never know that. Yeah. You know, now we're going, well, we might be able to know that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> pretty cool. Yeah. So maybe we should try to break and either go quickly to the discovery site. Uh-huh. Just talk about that real How quick. How far away is that? Because I'll have to break down the, the dish and everything it's if we... where we... The, the road to our camp hits the main road. Oh, okay. That's going to be too far for the yeah, Wi-Fi okay. router. You know, we go back to the port. Give these folks a 10-minute yeah. break. Yeah, okay. You know, go there. But we did find at this upper level uh -huh. teeth and little os ossicles, which are tiny little armor elements. Yeah. Fit between the bigger ones uh -huh. uh, in these polycampines. Laying on the ground, iguanodont teeth. Uh -huh. So we knew this level was early Cretaceous. Right. But we thought it was younger. We thought it was above the calcrete. Uh -huh. And it had just been altered to this uh, silica, you know, uh -huh. this chart. And uh, no, this is a whole different bed down here. Uh -huh. uh, so that was a big discovery. That's how we discovered there was a lower. This has always been mapped as Morrison. Yeah, yeah. Most of this valley is mapped as Morrison in the old maps. So they got it wrong. Yeah. I no wonder um, how was anyone to know better. Yeah. In fact, they used that sand, the poison strip, uh -huh. to define the base of the Cedar Mountain. That's really funny. The mappable unit. Uh huh. So this whole bowl was Morrison, and start looking at you know what we knew. So yeah. There's probably be a lot of yellow cat exposed in there. Yeah. We we're right. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm going to go ahead and hopefully I can just pull up our stream starting soon screen here, and then uh, we'll have a little break. I got to go set up the satellite dish over there. So we can stream from there. 
So let's see here. Um, right there. Gotta wait for this to load. Come on now. Um, and we will be coming back in just a minute. So everybody sit tight. And uh, we're just gonna go ahead and move over there and we'll show you how Jim and Co. originally discovered this fossil site in the first place. And Let's see. And look at that. We're back. All right. Excellent. Sorry about that, everybody. The Starlink took forever to reconnect right there. That was like 20 minutes. Not much you can do about that, though. Uh, anyway, um, welcome back to Paleontologizing. Thank you for being so patient, Jim. Oh, no problem. We're back online. It's reconnected with the satellites, and uh, yeah, so uh, everybody who just waltzed in recently, welcome to Paleontologizing. I'm here with Utah's state paleontologist, Jim Kirkland, and we're talking about uh, the geology here at this really, really important dinosaur site. So, yeah. Oh. Folks, if you want to look right here, we remember we were talking a little while ago about this silicified peat or agatized peat. And this has been reported as petrified logs by a number of people. <laughs> it's like they're beds, they're not logs. <laughs> but if you look at this stuff, you see it now crop, it comes and it thins and pinches out, and another one comes in. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a zone of these things. In fact, if you look down here, you see a root, yeah, or a couple of roots incorporated into it. It's beautiful. Look at that root. Nice. And just above it, we have the, the green beds mm -hmm. in which we're finding the bones. Now, what's special about this place, other than you have a really nice outcrop uh -huh. of the church and this transition, up on this bench here in the green is where we made the initial, or I made the initial discovery of Cretaceous fossils in this basin. Uh, in fact, we were back in, oh, this is probably like 90. 192 that I came out 
got the map from Helmut Doling, Lance Doling's bowl, uh -huh. uh, that showed me that this might be a good place to look. And we came and we parked on the other side of those hills over there. So we climbed up, saw a little bone on top, came down on top of the bench there, which is the Calcrete. It marks the base of the upper uh, yellow cat. Mm -hmm. Some bone coming out there. And dropped over onto this bench. Uh, there's more bone down here. <laughs> but I thought, oh, this must be the Calcrete, and it's just been turned to silica. You know, carbonate can alter silica too. Uh -huh. But that's not the case. As we've looked around this surface, you know, we see little bits of bone, lithics. Look at a couple of lithics right there. Yeah. Uh, getting osteoderm. Yeah, here's a little fragment of bone right here. Yeah, that. Is that an osteoderm or yeah, just a little, fleck, just of a little fleck of bone? Yeah. It's like a dinosaur bone. Yep, and they're all through these flats. We find bone, we've picked up teeth of a variety of animals. I was very convinced, good. Cretaceous, no problem, sitting on the cow creek. Um, you know, let's go back over where we have more fossils. And you can see bits here, and bits there. And, you know, we've actually found isolated bones. In fact, once we figured out that this stuff was older uh -huh. than we thought any of the Cretaceous stuff existed at, came over here with Scott Madsen and Don DeBlue and we started looking for fossils, and of course I came and showed them this. And when I'm looking around over here, it's right over on this side slope. Let's see. Now right in about there, I found a plate of an armored dinosaur coming out, a pretty big plate. Huh. So I worked on excavating it and going slow, you know, around the surface, and they got bored. <laughs> Yeah, okay, Jim, hurry it up. <laughs> so you're going, oh, let's go look again. And when they came to look, we usually look on the lower slopes, mm -hmm. you know, lower steep slopes. Yeah. Because uh, bone comes out and weathers down the slope. Right. Normally we find it on hillsides, sides of canyons, stuff like that. Yeah. So they're wandering around and they come all the way to that backside over there. And finally, uh, well, we're not seeing anything coming down that slope. So they come walking back to. You know, say, come on, Jim, move it. <laughs> Get out of here. So they come over here, but as they walked over here, and we can't really see, it's that over that little grassy rise is where our quarries are. You can't quite see the top of the tarps. Yeah. But uh, it's just over that. Uh, Don stopped on just the south side of the road. Scott stopped over here. And they, d they oh, they spoke. You know, and they start digging and, you know, scratching and sweeping. And holy cow, we got to show Jim this. At the same time, they both stood up, turned, and looked at each other uh -huh. and realized they were on the same bed, uh, football field apart. Yeah. You know, which is pretty exciting. And now we know <laughs> this level, you know, just pan across this, is at the floor of this entire valley and only a few meters deep anywhere. Uh -huh. There's a lot of acres of potential fossil country. Back right over in here, saw a white patch coming up. Dug down to the tibia of a big ankylosaur this long. <laughs> you know, this big around. It's huge. It's going straight down into this stuff. Uh -huh. you know, so we've pulled a few bones here, but it's mostly teeth, ossicles, things of that sort. Uh -huh. Now, if you wander with me up this little draw here, I'll show you something interesting that our friend Fisher found a couple weeks ago. Yes, maybe three weeks. I don't know. You were here. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> but once again, the same beds. So this is just a continuous bed of dinosaur bones throughout basically the entire valley here. And you know, a little Pretty bit incredible. different taxonomic signature, different sites. Mm -hmm. If I can go down over here, you see that, or perhaps here. Get old, have bad knees. Look at that. Just yeah. beautiful. <laughs> beautiful stuff. But as we come along here, oh, there's our green bed again. You see this Valley Four Terrace here. Yeah. Uh huh. Full of church and port sites.
Maybe a little bone coming out right there. Yeah, there's some right there. It's already got some glue on it right here. There's some dinosaur bone right there. Just coming out of the side of the wash. And uh, yeah, this is pretty, you know, it's not unique in terms of its density of dinosaur bone, but this is unique in terms of its age. There, yeah, given the age. Yeah. A little more bone, of course. A bigger bone came out of here. Yeah, this Fishers is. flipped it and jacketed it. Fishers extracted this this morning. So we'll bring it to camp. Yeah. Tonight. There's remnants of plaster there, all that white right there. digging in, he said. Yeah. You know, looking here, there's actually more bone. Yeah. So this is a place that might be worth opening. Yeah. So we might come back here in a future year and just knock this just down. Clean this whole thing off. Dig right in, yeah. But literally, this thing's so big. Uh huh. As you see the time, how long it takes us to es excavate this stuff. Yeah. There's hundreds of years of solid excavation could, could go on here. Yeah, extraordinary. You know, it needs to be protected because there aren't other sites like this. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, Dolings Bowl is kind of a little magical valley. Right. You know, with this fauna that so far exists nowhere else anywhere in North America. Uh huh. And that's pretty exciting. Pretty special. Holy cow. And there's Something a. I wanted to show you folks the original discovery spot uh -huh. and one of our newest discoveries. <laughs> <laughs> Within feet of each other. Yeah, holy cow. Um, there's camp over there just to orient you. And then for the past three weeks, we've been digging in the quarry, which is just over that rise. You can just. You can't quite see the tops of the shade tarps up there, but it's like 100 meters in that direction or less. Um, I keep saying they need to have a solar uh, or a uh, satellite link hooked to his hat. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. Get you covered. <laughs> the future. Yeah. <laughs> There's a dinosaur tibia. Maybe I'll show everybody that, the one that I found over there uh, on my way back to the vehicle. Oh, sure. Yeah. Take them on over. And, uh, Tell them your story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, one of our first evenings in camp. Uh, me and Fisher and Ethan, some other people were just kind of walking through here, you know, enjoying that it was becoming nice and cool in the early evening. And Fisher found that bone. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Let me keep walking along here. And then, let's see, there's a big old limb bone of a dinosaur coming out right here. There we go. Yeah. So that is a dinosaur limb bone there. You see how it's kind of shiny? It's been hit with some glue in order to keep it from eroding too much. But yeah, this is just continuing at the same level as over there, that bone that Fisher excavated today. Stuff coming out all over the place. If we were to, you know, really get a big crew bone but uh, this place is definitely worthy of that kind of status because holy cow is this place really scientifically important the oldest Cretaceous dinosaurs in North America and they're all over the place here what a cool location uh, um, so yeah, with that said, I think I'm going to put you guys on hold for just another couple minutes. Hopefully the Starlink will reboot faster when I bring it back to the quarry. And uh, I'll show you what we've been working on over there. So uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, oh and did it cut out again? Let's see. I'm not sure what happened. But, uh, yeah. Oh, just for a moment. Okay, good. Everybody was freaking out about that. But I will put you on hold for just another moment, everybody. And we're going to go back to the quarry. I'll set the, the dish back up there. So hang tight. I'll be back in hopefully less than 10 minutes. But stick around. I will get it back up and running.
All right, let's see if that did it. Here we are back at the quarry. Can you see or hear me? Somebody confirm, please. Um, chat is frozen, it appears. Mm -hmm. All right, chat not cooperating. What is wrong with this? It looks like we're on. For some reason, my chat is not working though, which is bizarre. Let me try restarting it. Info. Four stop. And open it back up again. Now it's working. Okay. If it's not one thing, it's another, everybody. You know? Live broadcast. But welcome back to the quarry. <laughs> and uh, I managed to prevent unplugging the uh, Starlink, so it just booted right back up again. Excellent. Good stuff. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. Now I can see everybody. So here's the quarry we've been working for the past 22 days now, and we're trying to wrap things up here. And ooh, looks like uh, my big limb bone over there has been fully jacketed. Excellent. That happened uh, while we were over there talking about geology. Good stuff. Wow, nice jacket here. Ooh, found that. Well, Very nice. <laughs> yeah. It's the bone that I found the other day, and man, is that looking solid. This is excellent. I was really nervous we weren't be able to wouldn't be able to get this out before we left. So this is, uh, this is good news. Yeah. Um, we're definitely getting the end and, you know, Ethan keeps finding little stuff over yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, nice. You got a uh, jacket on that, Ethan? On that little theropod, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So we've got some potential well, skull bones from a little theropod dinosaur, a little two-legged meat-eating dinosaur. Little might be big. I don't know, we won't know until we get it back to the lab and Ethan cleans it up. But, uh, got a jacket on that too. That is excellent. This is really crunch time. We've got basically one more day of digging tomorrow and then we gotta close up the quarry tomorrow afternoon. So yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Um... <laughs> But yeah, anybody, if you've got any questions, let me know. Yeah. But right here, we've got a beautiful rib. Right here. Uh, another potential rib going down right there. But there are some potential theropod skull bones in here, which are super, super important. So that's excellent. Here's a chunk of other random dinosaur bone that we probably won't collect because it's just kind of floating on the surface and isn't going to be of much value scientifically. But uh, there's bone all over the place in here. Yeah. Um, oh, and paleontologist VA. I'm going to be at Lori's site, which is just a few miles from here. Um, hopefully in September. Uh, that's in the upper yellow cat member. Oh, it's in the poison strip. That's right. Yeah, above the the upper yellow cat in the Cedar Mountain formation. So yeah, yeah. Um, good stuff. And what is the process for closing the quarry? That's a great question, Arle. Um, yeah. Tune in tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, you might be able to watch tomorrow. We'll see. Um, I don't know, or if it's really, really crunch time, then I won't, I won't stream that part. We'll see. Oh, you can hang it somewhere, let the old yeah. 
Yeah, watch us run around like ants, moving all this rock. But yeah, basically what we're gonna do is... Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, once we've got all the jackets removed, we uh, take some of this debris here, the talus pile, and we shovel it back into the quarry. We want to make it look as natural as possible. Um, A, to help prevent the site from being discovered by poachers or other ne'er-do-wells. And B, you know, we're working on federal public land here. And we want to be as respectful as possible and try and make this landscape look as natural as possible when we leave. You know, minimal impact. We, probably, we won't fill it all in. Oh no, we're not going to fill just the whole thing in. Slope some of the, the side. Yeah, it's not going to look like somebody dig a pit. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot more kind of smooth. Like we won't and... go do almost anything over here because there's no bone in the wall. Yeah. And yeah. Naturally, it'll smooth out. Uh huh. But we gotta yeah, reopen it again. Yeah. Yeah. Because we'll be back here next year. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. So. Uh, yeah. Cute little bone yeah. under that plastic plaster strip there. Oh yeah, that's See nice. See you in 2024, bone. <laughs> It looks interesting, but it's right over here. Get we're not going stuff. any farther into that wall. Yeah, so that's what we call a winter jacket right there. Yeah. Just we will cover it. We'll cover it up and Yeah. Go get it next year. So yeah. Shoot, how many uh, how many specimens were we up to now collected so far on the on the log? We're at 145. 145. The, yeah, the number, but how many? What did we start? I think we started at like 60 or something. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we've had like 85. Yeah, that's impressive. A lot of elements dug up, and we're gonna get a lot more out today and tomorrow, so, yeah. Um, I don't think we have any more big ones to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good stuff, and hang on a minute, do we have... Oh, is Ken here? In chat? Oh. Let's see. Ken, we miss you. Oh, Ken says hi to all. Ken, I found your dental pick. Ah. <laughs> I'll give it to Danny to give it to you at Lori's if you all both go together. Okay, cool. Yeah, Ken, if you're going to be at Lori's site, that'll be nice. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, very expensive after all. <laughs> uh, we miss you too, Ken. Thanks for being here in chat. Holy cow. Uh, we know you're here in spirit. And also, you know, type it into the chat. Have a good time draw. Yeah. Oh, Ken says, tell Ethan it's his. Aww. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Yeah. So you want to describe what you're doing right now, Ethan? I am removing rocks from around the dinosaur bone. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. So that I can remove said dinosaur bone from said rocks. Yeah. It's, uh... I guess it gets pretty simple when you don't have a lot of, you know, when you know where the bone is and where it's not, you can work pretty quickly and try to move the rock from around it. Again, it's crunch time. We ought to be uh, getting this stuff packed up. Right there you can see we've got the old generator already in the back of the truck. We're going to take that back at the end of the day. Don has been kind of staging some of our supplies so we can take those back this evening and get a head start for site cleanup tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. Um, oh, and Lenina, thank you for that gift sub there to Ken. That is brilliant. Uh, Matthias says, being a paleontologist was my childhood dream. But you're still interested in the prehistoric era? Well, I'm glad you're here. It sounds like you're in the right place. Welcome to paleontologizing. Yeah. Good stuff. And shoot, it's already a quarter to five. How late do you think we'll be staying today, Don? I'm hoping to get out of here in the next half hour. All right, cool. Yeah, we're making excellent time. I'm, or you guys are, I guess. I'm standing around yapping to the camera. But, uh, nicely done. Yeah. And Bombardactyl says, how was the site first discovered? Well, shoot, we just talked about that a few minutes ago. And uh, we showed you the original discovery spot. But Jim and Don and, and Scott Madsen were out here? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Discovered some uh, dinosaur bone fragments. Jim, was it your idea to come out to this valley in the first place? Oh, I dragged him out here, yeah. <laughs> so what was the reasoning there? Well, we were, I already had come out here and discovered the small stuff. Uh-huh. You know, because I knew it wasn't horse and it was going to be Cedar Mountain. Uh-huh. Uh, but when we realized 
that this Cedar Mountain stuff was at a lower level than anything we'd ever found previously. Uh -huh. I talked to John, Don and Scott and said, yeah, come on, we gotta go find more than teeth and ossicles. Mm -hmm. We need to find some bones. And we went up there and we looked, these guys walked the whole valley. I ended up pretty quickly on getting here, finding a big ankylosaur plate mm -hmm. that I would work on excavating. These guys were going to come on board, so he's sitting there. I just remember the feet going tap, 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 tap <laughs> <laughs> by my head as I'm working on this thing. And uh, I said, oh, let's go out and look around a little more. So he came around when they are on the backside there. They're like, well, you know, we've been here. We haven't found anything. Mm -hmm. So they started walking across the flatlands back instead of hugging the rim. Uh -huh. And Scott found some bone right over on that little bench right over there. That's Scott's place. And Don, on just on the other side of the road, Don's place, Don found part of a theropod coming out of the ground. Mm -hmm. That turned out to be the holotype of Yorgobuchia. Hmm. Uh, potential ancestor of Utah Raptor, but you never know. And, uh, you know, Don was playing with that, Scott was playing with this, and they finally thought to themselves, well, we, let's go show, you know, get Kirkland, show him this stuff. And they stood up and they turned toward each other just randomly <laughs> and realized they were pretty much on the same site. <laughs> just a hundred, about 100 meters apart. Uh -huh. Like the uh, same horizon, like yeah, the same, same bone horizon, bearing layer. Yeah. Nice. You know, so I was like, okay, this looks interesting. Yeah, you got a little bag there. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I guess the rest is history. What year yeah. would that have been? It was 2004. Yeah. 2004. And so shoot, almost 20 years ago. 2005 is when we collected the Yerguguchi stuff. Uh huh. 2007 is when we actually did part of the summer field season here. Nice. Yeah. Because we were still working in Don's Ridge. Uh huh. Another place that where Don yeah. found Iguana <laughs> Colossus, right? Or is that uh, Don's Ridge North? Uh, yeah, we were working, yeah. finishing Don's Ridge North, basically yeah. at that point. Nice. We got the U to come out, you know. Every, uh, came out, they you know, pretty good crew, mm -hmm. and move overburden with us, help us, and we didn't find another bone. <laughs> Jeez. So they dug, you know, half a day, just plowing away, plowing away, uh -huh. and we had pretty much finished the site before. <laughs> <laughs> but you never know, it was solid bone right up to the wall. Yeah. So that it stopped all of a sudden was unexpected. <laughs> Now we had a question, uh, would it be frowned upon if another crew came out here and dug this site while we were gone? Yeah. And definitely, yeah. Dug this site, we've had someone do that for mm. one animal that uh, they knew they were caught with their pants down. <laughs> um, but I'm not against, you know, a group coming in and saying, we're gonna dig this area uh -huh. and we're gonna, you know, we do this area. Yeah. But it's such a big site. As long as somebody asks and we know what's going on. And, and we coordinate, so we're collecting the same data, we're using the same grid. Yeah. You know, so the data is compatible. And so you collaborate on the research, yeah. presumably. Yeah. 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 I, I'm not against it. I'm, you know, pretty open to that. You know, in a few years, I'm gonna retire. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You know, most people my age have already retired. Uh, and I'd like to see work continue out here. Mm -hmm. But we would have, all this would have to have the permission of the Bureau of Land Management. Mm -hmm. And we probably need a sign off uh, by the Utah Museum of Natural History since they're our repository. See, if we opened up, someone opened up another area, say, reopened Jim's place. Mm -hmm. And we know there's lots of stuff over there. Yeah. And started going in. Well, the U might say, well, we want all the fossils because mm -hmm. we've already got all the fossils. And generally, the BLM has a, pol a policy that was made up uh, after the Cleveland Lloyd you know, kind of semi fiasco. Mm. Uh, basically, that they want fossils from one site to go to one institution. Right, which makes sense on a certain level. Yeah. Like, you know. But you know, with a site this big, you know, you know, as long as you're keeping good track, I see nothing wrong with you know. You just don't want people just to, every other year different groups working, you know, on the same map area. Mm -hmm. you know, so if they're working. 100 meters that way, plenty of bones. You know, I'm not against that whatsoever. <laughs> well, cool. Uh, yeah. I mean, this really is such a huge, huge yeah, I mean, area. Yeah. People work this long after we're not working it anymore. Yeah. And we just want that to be something that's done, you know, logically and scientifically. Right. So that we don't lose data. Uh huh.
Maybe that's the most important thing. Right. Okay, here's, uh, speaking of data, here's Fisher hammering in. A nail right here, it refuses to cooperate. But, uh... It's falling out all year. Yeah. But those data spikes are critically important. That's just gonna keep yeah. chiseling that apart. Yeah. Ugh. I don't envy you those there. Big, those big nails. <laughs> uh, I wish we had a big nail gun. <laughs> uh, drive them in. Yeah. We've been, we've been very fortunate not to drive nails into the fossils. Yeah. It, I mean, remarkable uh -huh. sometimes. But we did find one plate that we, of an ankylosaur that we put the nail right through the middle of it. Yeah. All around, just, just hole in the middle of the plate. Oh, okay, well, at least it didn't smash yeah. it into pieces. Yeah, anything, it was yeah. Uh, a dead center. Yeah. Uh, you know, when they were doing the Seismosaurus, uh -huh. which now, of course, is the big Diplodocus, uh -huh. uh, they were drilling uh, to see if there was bone in an area that they predicted to be bone in. Yeah. When they finally excavated the area, the drill core went right through the neural canal of a vertebra. <laughs> this bone completely. <laughs> I mean, to get that shot. Yeah. That's that, pretty remarkable. Yeah, pretty remarkable. <laughs> All right. And let's see, could Jim name a conservator of sorts for the immediate area when the time comes for him to retire? I don't know if it works that way, unfortunately. Nah, it doesn't yeah. work that way. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, if they hire someone with my same interests, and the chances of that are pretty slim. Uh-huh. You know, it, it really is. I mean, everyone has unique interests. Yeah. And, you know, I'm pretty committed to doing a lot here. Yeah. Whereas other people, you know, they oh, got work here for a while, but yeah, it doesn't like their father. It's one reason I love to see this place get special status. Because uh -huh. you know, when you're talking archaeology, you know, Chaco Canyon, Mesa Verde, you know, the big sites get set aside. Uh -huh. And in some cases, sites in the United States get set aside when they're, you know, really unique sites. Yeah. And these this sites are really get unique stretch site. here. There's nothing like this elsewhere in North America. Yeah, or the world uh, for that matter. Yeah. I mean, shoot. So it's, I would like to see some special designation, uh -huh. but not lock it up. Yeah, we would still be able to work make here. Make it a yeah. research natural area uh -huh. uh, where research is the primary goal. Yeah. Science, you know, being ongoing here, and interpretation, you know, develop a better infrastructure for uh -huh. doing things like you're doing right now. Yeah. You know, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I think there's real potential. Who knows what we'll be doing in 50 to 100 years. Yeah. I hope we're still doing this stuff. <laughs> Me too. Shoot. Yes. Yeah. Now, we had a comment in chat. Uh, Jim is not the king of Utah, but he should be. <laughs> <laughs> and if Jim were king, what's that? Mayor of Green River, maybe. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, oh, there'd boy. certainly be a lot more funding for fossil science if Jim were king. Yeah. I know we keep trying to figure out how can we get money to Utah programs. So yeah. Say paleontologists, I serve more than our own program. I serve, right. I serve all the programs in the state. What is your job as, I mean, for those of watching at home, what is your job as Utah state paleontologist entail? We, we issue the permits uh -huh. you know, to people working on state land. And Utah, sharing with Nevada, has more state land than any other state yeah. other than Nevada. Uh, so we have a lot of state land. We have a lot, you know, we have four major Utah Raptor sites. Mm -hmm. Three of them are on state land. Yeah. You know, so we have, you know, controlling interests in some really important things. <laughs> I also oversee our statewide paleo locality database, mm -hmm. which is used by federal agencies, state agencies, you know, uh, and, you know, everyone. We're, we're actually the example right, remarkable of how resource, it should be yeah. done because we're the first state uh -huh. to really do it to the detail that had been done. Yeah. It, was, it was going on for 25 years before I got here. Uh -huh. You know, and I've just been building upon it. Uh -huh. and, as, and as Dawn has been involved, we've been, you know, really looking at new ways. We're trying to do it so it's all digital. Yeah. You know, everybody goes out with a tablet and uh -huh. records the data as they find it. Very cool. Yeah, it's it, the potential for the future of the database, uh -huh. I think, is real important. Uh, I also promote paleontology. Of Utah. Yeah. We have one of the greatest records of the history of life of any place this size on the planet. You know, uh -huh. I always like to joke because the only place comparable is England. Yeah. You know, England's got a remarkably complete yep. record. The birthplace yeah. of geology in some and ways. Yeah. And if Utah yeah. had a lot of people here with some, you know, uh -huh. you know, doing science in the past, yeah, we probably would have done it here too. Yeah. But, 
uh, this place, that I-70 only went through the swell uh -huh. in the 70s. Shoot. You know, so yeah. a lot of this country is like, why are you going to come out here? They're actually, you would drive to Green River and go north to Salt Lake. Right. In Denver. Uh-huh. You know, or if you were going to L.A., yeah. you know, you'd have to diagonally cut through Hanksville and mm -hmm. really take the back roads yeah. down. Uh-huh. Uh, so it's pretty interesting, uh, you know, to picture, you know, Wyoming was... The, Wagon train routes, the railroad yep, routes. Yeah, the railroad go through. Everything yeah. went through there. Mm -hmm. And here we're just on the edge of where <laughs> things in a lot of Utah, like Grand Staircase, was, wasn't opened up to very recently. Yeah. Yeah, you know, really, Trunk Canyon. One of the last explored places in the continental U.S., I think you were, Ethan yeah. said? Yeah. Henry Mountains, yeah. last mountain range to be put on the maps. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's huh. it's kind a, of a, still a new frontier in some ways. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. But basically, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how to ensure our citizens, our local, you know, rural communities get seek get benefit mm -hmm. from these resources without destroying them. You right. Know? I mean, it's like, oh, let's dig them up and sell them. That's <laughs> short-term uh, thinking. Yeah. Uh, you know, let's create interpretive sites. You know, and paleo tourism, which is big in many countries. Yeah. And in many states, Utah. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a, our one-sheet tourist. Flyer on dinosaurs. The dinosaur sites. diamond, yeah. And, well, more dinosaur diamond. You yeah. Know, all the dinosaur museum, St. George, uh -huh. are on the diamond. But uh, you know, we got more things to do already than any other state. And people do come from all over the world to see this stuff. Yeah. You know, As nice they stuff. should. It's remarkable. Yeah. You know, and we just need, in my mind, set more interpretive sites. Mm -hmm. When we look at our big five national parks. You know, they're getting so overcrowded. We need to have other attractions. Yeah. To spread people out. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, and I think the paleontology resources in this region could provide one of these great areas to get some people to go visit that. Yeah. So you don't have 500 people at Delicate Arch at any moment. You have only <laughs> 250 people at Delicate Arch at any moment. Yep. I'm all for that. Yeah. <laughs> now, I got a question here. Are there any important quarries or formations that sit right on a state line and are therefore legally awkward to excavate? Mm. Uh, Rabbit Valley almost crosses the state line. I worked there, yeah. you know, two miles from the border. Uh -huh. I uh, was actually a couple weeks ago out checking a place where we uh, reported on a hadrosaur uh -huh. uh, less than one mile from the Utah line in Colorado. Uh -huh. huh. uh, but straddling the line, not yet. Yeah. You know, and I've always had nightmares of, you know, finding a dinosaur. It goes under an archaeologic site. Oh boy! Because archaeology it does have historic precedent. Uh -huh. uh, all laws relative to archaeology yeah. have precedent over laws regarding paleontology. Right. So yeah, they they usually have. So uh, yeah, it's a nightmare. Very right unlikely. Away. Uh huh. You know, but our our native peoples collected fossils commonly. Uh -huh. you know, there's lots of data. That's cool, actually. Can you give any, any neat examples of that? Well, you know, shark teeth in particular. Uh huh. There was uh, Chaco. A little, I think it might have been Pueblo Benito, the big, you know, uh -huh. semicircular Pueblo. Uh, I think there was like an alcove where there was an Eocene mammal jaw. Oh, okay. And that thing had to be brought in from at least 50 miles away. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't local. Uh -huh. uh, but someone said, what kind of jaw is this? You know, <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I'm out hunting and I've, I've never seen an animal you uh -huh. know, in this region yeah. that looks anything like that. Uh -huh. And... Um, <laughs> I'm bringing it home, and they put it in Elko, a special place. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, our native peoples, you know, recognize this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, the tracks that have interpreted as the, you know, footprints of the Thunderbird. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's why that legend is so pervasive in the West. Huh. You know, you think it has something to do with the pervasiveness of the fossils? Well, the tracks. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, you find the track site. Huh. You know, like the mega tracks that run arches. Yeah, yeah. You know, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of tracks. Yeah. You know, it's like they're obvious. These are footprints of three toe, big three toed things. Yeah. What do you have in your experience <laughs> that has three toes? Yeah. Birds. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's a logical conclusion. Uh huh. And Hitchcock in the Connecticut Valley interpreted the track sites there in the, sixth, the late sixth, uh, 17th century uh -huh. uh, as being a, from Noah's Raven. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, same interpretation. Yep. You know, except Native Americans came up with it 400 years before Hitchcock. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Let's see if we've got any other questions. Oops. Let's scroll down. Um. 
Let's see. Well, with the borders thing, I have a... Shoot, when I was working up at Rudyard, that was like less than two miles from the Canadian border. Um, but that was like a patchwork of private and, uh, and federal land, I think. Some state mixed in also. But we had access to like all of that, which was really nice. Um, but yeah, luckily, did not go across the border, the, the coolie there. Or at least we never followed it across yeah, the border. And, you know, we have important sites down near Bryce that uh -huh. we can't access because it's private land. Yeah. It's the only access point. They won't let us cross it. Uh-huh. You know, uh, and it's real sad because we have the only Coney Asian dinosaur sites in the world. Yeah, Right shoot. at the foot of Bryce, but they're inaccessible. Right. You know, you're not going to climb down from the top to dig up dinosaurs. Uh-huh. You know? Let's hope someday that opens up because that would be really cool. Oh, it's really, yeah. it's really important. Yeah. There's a lot of people egging to get in there. Mm-hmm. Not not going to do about it. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe I'll bring over the... Is there anything you'd want to point out on our dinosaurs of Utah sheep? Just trying to think of what would be instructive for people to see. Um, One of the big things, yeah. you know, that's nice to point out to people. And I've got that other chart that you really should get a copy of too. But okay. You don't. But anyway, you know, here's a Cedar Mountain formation. Uh huh. You know, time-wise, yeah, from yeah. there to there. Here's the Upper Cretaceous. Yeah. You know, Grand Staircase is that. Just a little yeah. Yeah. You know, we have twice the record that they have a Grand Staircase, even uh -huh. though that is a really rich time for dinosaurs. Yeah. And, like, the Parrot Formation is 3,000 feet. Uh-huh. And if you look at my chart, while we eat, the Don and I work quite a bit, uh -huh. and the Kaparowitz, we show it as one fauna each. Uh-huh. Joe Serdich, formerly the Denver Museum, basically wants to split Kaparowitz into three and while we've been to three faunas. So that'd be six. Six. Them. Holy cow. So you add four, you know, we say yeah. 27, okay, 31. <laughs> now we go down to the uh, lower yellow cat, this little tiny interval. Uh -huh. We know there's two faunas over on the uh, south of Green River, uh -huh. uh, probably lapping up from this basin. Over this that uh, crystal geyser? Yeah, and, yeah. and the Suarez site above it. Yeah, two yeah. different faunas. Uh -huh. And you come down here, and I think we're a bit older, you know, we're a little lower, so this is a third fauna. Mm -hmm. And that ironstone fauna may be a fourth fauna uh -huh. in there. So, okay, you go up to like 35 in sequential dinosaur faunas. Mm -hmm. And the stuff in this John Henry, you know, straight cliffs formation, this stuff, you know, as we say in here, well, do I say it clearly? Yeah, new frontier. Because <laughs> that stuff has not been developed yet. Uh -huh. But we know their sites. Right. And some of them are not accessible because of where they are uh -huh. in terms of ownership of the sites. And they'll be all new dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> but this record is still really coarse compared to the history of what we have in Utah. Uh -huh. And this is our only blank, Middle Jurassic. Uh -huh. But we have tracks. Uh -huh. So we know there are a lot of dinosaurs around, and sure. you know, we have long kind of body fossils of them, yeah. Theropod tracks. Uh -huh. you, know, you know, there's some conifer branches and things. Mm -hmm. So we know this stuff was living here, we just haven't found any bone sites. Gotcha. Uh, someday. Yeah. <laughs> and with the coniation up there, is that another blank spot that we have? Yeah, coniation. Yeah. And, and most of the Santonia is pretty blank, too. Uh -huh. So there is some Santonian yeah. uh, over there in Cedar Canyon, uh -huh. you know, right above Cedar City, way in the southwestern part of the state. Hmm. But, you know, you see how narrow those are, you know, time-wise. You know, Campanian is a much bigger interval. Yeah. You know, Maastrichtian is not all that big. Uh-huh. You know, but, you know, the Aptian Albion... You know, which is mainly the Ruby Ranch interval. Mm -hmm. You know, that's almost a third of the Cretaceous record. It's those two stages. When I look at this and I see how huge the Cedar Mountain formation is there in the green. Time-wise. Time-wise, yeah, yeah. Very thin otherwise. I mean, is it because it's so thin that those are just members and not formations under themselves? Yeah, it's, you know, same, someone may eventually come in and say, ah, oh, let's split the yellow cat off uh -huh. as its own formation. Right. You know, that's, that's certainly possible. I'm, you know, I was making enough waves when I made all these members, mm -hmm. you know, initially, because it was basically, 
you know, Cedar Mountain formation with a Buckhorn conglomerate as base. And that was it. And that was it for, <laughs> for many, many years. Uh -huh. And it was a very different story. And there were only two, three things reported from the the muds in the Cedar Mountain. Mm -hmm. And one of them, I'm pretty sure, is from the Morrison and not huh. the Cedar Mountain. Uh -huh. So there's really only two animals, right. and both by misname. Uh -huh. yeah. It's a it's a great story. Yeah. And of course the Navajos, Chin Lee. Chin Lee's real red, see so fauna, fauna, fauna. Uh -huh. We just there's only one kind of dinosaur, but right. there's all kinds of Triassic fossils on the Chin Lee. Very cool. Very rich. This yeah. is just dinosaurs. Now we had a question about um if you had any documentaries to recommend to the viewers, maybe ones that you were in. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Google uh, Utah's Dinosaur Graveyard. Yeah, the whole thing is on YouTube, and it's good. We've actually shown that many times on stream before, like snippets of that. And I'm sure I'll continue to do that. Yeah, yeah, we had a couple episodes of when dinosaurs roamed North America. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they did a nice episode on our Zuni stuff. Yeah. Which is in Utah, but we do have equivalent rocks there. Yeah, and you do a lot of Morrison stuff in that, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we've watched clips of that also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we got a few, but yeah, when dinosaurs roamed North America, yeah. I mean, roamed America. Now, Utah's dinosaur graveyard. Yeah. I'm really proud of that because they show the science behind it. That was thing. really excellent. Yeah. yeah and I yeah. kind of like that because so many of the shows nowadays are sensationalist. Yeah, let's CGI, have a bunch of dinosaurs yeah. fighting, yeah. wrestling, you know, trying to run around, uh -huh. and then kill them all at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Big disaster at the end of the show. Right. And yeah. that's like over and over what we seem to get lately. Uh -huh. And it's like, yeah, let's tell these stories. <laughs> there may, I can't confirm anything, but maybe there'll be another documentary sometime soon featuring Jim in the next couple of years. But uh, that's all I, I can mean, say like about 2025. that now. 2025. 2025? I think so. Maybe happen. Okay. <laughs> keep, your, uh, keep your ears peeled and your eyes listening for that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, let me see if we got any other questions. Yeah, I usually like to find younger, prettier people than me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not hard. Uh, well, cool. If we were to change anything about this, Jim, like what, what's... what's uh, well, better art than the dinosaurs. I, you know, I'd love to get this made into a I mean, big poster and sell in national parks. You know, I, I know a guy who sometimes does some yeah, art and yeah. some live streams, and he might be interested yeah, in uh, this. I, I would love to do this. Turning yeah. into a, a poster uh -huh. that could be sold by, you know, in the national parks. I love that yeah. idea. Yeah. We I, should do that with, um, yeah, that'd be really, really cool. Like, have a, a whole rock column on here, make it look mm -hmm. a little bit more artsy, nice background on it. That'd be awesome. Yeah, the facts are there. We just need to pretty it up, really. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Um, very cool. Well, let me know if you got any other questions, chat. Um, but yeah, yeah. And am I in anybody's way right now? Should I scoot over? I think we're good. Looks like we're getting ready to wrap up. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> How many oh. different uh, jackets or, or specimens do we have today that were just collected? Well, I don't know. I, don't I mean, you can look in the back of the truck if you want to see some of the big jackets. Yeah, let's take a look at those. I mean, I've got a couple of people on that. Oh, baby. yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. That's yeah. Really Fisher and I. But let's yeah. see. Some of the big boys are in the back there. Yeah, let's take a look at those. There's an action packer filled with well. some of the jackets. All right. DNR truck. And ask Jim if Siach lived in a so Siach. Why? What? Is that like a pun? Oh boy. <laughs> oh yeah. Gypsonas in there. Take a look at those. Very nice. So each one of those, hopefully, is scientifically important. Bit of dinosaur bone. And a bunch of the little wrap ups in here. Yeah. yeah the the season's bounty. Let's see. Yeah, some of our larger jackets there. Excellent. Good stuff. All of our hard work. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and the, yeah, the dinosaur's name is pronounced Siach. 
I think that's why the pun doesn't really work that well. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Is that a Ute word, siach? It's language of one, one group of native people, but I don't know if it's the Ute or who. Uh. But man, and man, this is so nice here, getting you those know, bones out of the way. I think it's possible yeah. No, I think it might be possible. It's fish dermal material. That would make sense. It's what's got all the little bumps yeah. on there. Well, Naomi Keeley's. Oh, and know. Torvo Phil. Yeah, we're closing up tomorrow. How you doing, Phil? Good to see you. Yeah. Got the nickname Bumper Bees. Code for them. And he says, "Do the bones you find belong to the state, or do you own them if you find them?" So these are are off of public land, federal land. Bureau of Land, Man land Management Land, so they belong to the people of the United States. So we, here working with the Utah Geological Survey, are but humble servants of the people. We are excavating these fossils to bring them back to where they belong in a museum. So they will be held in the public trust. These belong to the people of the U.S. They're part of our collective natural heritage, so they should be preserved. Um, as a dinosaur paleontologist, somebody who, you know, does science on dinosaurs, something I'm really passionate about, you know? These fossils belong to all of us. They shouldn't be sold to the highest bidder. Um, especially not when they're on public land. You know, if they're on public land, they belong to the public. They belong in a museum. Um, but yeah, and we had another question. Yeah. And Phil, I'm glad you're enjoying your air-conditioned palace. Very nice. Yeah. Um, and what happens with the stream after I close up? I'll be streaming from my office, like I do during the rest of the year. And T3Bear says, where did the two miles of rock above the site go? I know erosion, but that's a lot of rock. No, it is a lot of erosion, yeah. Shoot. Erosion is an incredible thing. You know, it can happen very slowly. What was that, Jim? Dalton, California. Here, let's have you say that to the camera, so. <laughs> what was that again? It all went into basically, you know, the Pacific Gulf of California because yeah. we're on the west side of the Continental Divide. Right, right. It ended up in the Pacific, eventually. Uh -huh. Nice. You know, Being deposited down there. The edges, uh -huh. Actually just kept down cutting all the way. Yeah, and I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, tens of millions of years here, so there's a lot of time for this erosion take place. Yeah, probably we had deposition here to oh, 135, maybe 130. Uh -huh. I mean, not 130, uh, to 35 to 30 million years ago. Yeah. And then we get the uplift, probably underplating uh -huh. of the eastern Pacific, uh -huh. you know, as we have to go over the rise. Right. And that warm oceanic crust buoyed up the plateau. Huh. Because you all know the Colorado Plateau is twice as thick as the Rocky Mountain region and the Great Basin all the way around us. <laughs> you know, Pretty cool. Buoyed yeah. up. That's why uh -huh. we get this high plateau, we got all this warm oceanic rock under us. Uh -huh. and welded on to the underside <laughs> back in the Miocene. And shoot, Jim has been digging dinosaurs on the Colorado Plateau for 50 years now. As Over of, 50. Yeah. As of this spring, yeah. Pretty incredible. Um, but yeah, and he asks, where will Jim go? I want to meet him again, too. And he's going to go up to Salt Lake along with the rest <laughs> of these guys in a few days. Yeah. Um, I'll probably see me at Lori's site a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm Hopefully, I'm going to be streaming from Lori's site just a few miles that way uh, from about mid-September through early October. And uh, Jim's going to be there uh, talking about stuff, and we're going to be digging up some ankylosaurs together. It's going to be really good. Yeah. And I probably, you know, do some stuff with Josh Lively. Yeah. Dynamic paleontologist. I'm excited for all of you to meet Josh Lively. He's he's now running the uh, the museum in Price, Utah. Prehistoric museum at the Utah State University. Yeah. And I have high hopes that he's going to be a major player in this part of the world. Yeah. Exciting stuff. He was uh, another one of the drivers for the pre-meeting field trip for our, our conference mm. in June. And... Uh, yeah, it's, I think that's the first time I'd ever met Josh, but yeah, he's cool. I'm excited to get to know him better, and uh, yeah, he's going to be running things at that site with a lot of uh, consultation from you well, and Donna. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, I know these rocks more than he does, but, uh -huh. you know, basically, you know, he's building a program, mm -hmm. 
And I said, do we want to take over this site? I'm a couple of years from retirement. Uh-huh. Let's see if Josh is interested. Yeah. And, you know, we were able to get Josh to be the guy in charge. I nice. certainly want a little input because uh-huh. they're digging in kylosaurs, and I kind of like those things. <laughs> uh, and they have some great ones on exhibit. Yeah. I don't know if you've done one talking about their their group of ankylosaurs on exhibit. Oh, at it's, the Museum in Price. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've it's, talked about that before. Uh, Animantarx. Museums and We've got Mark. three of them. Yeah. And hopefully soon there'll be four. Nice. Four or five. Yeah. That's <laughs> Gastonia, Animantarx, and who's the third one? Uh, Pleuroplites. Pleuroplites. Giant. Oh, pe- Pleuroplites. Yeah, Pleuroplites. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and very it's cool. you know almost elephant size, except it's got short, much shorter legs. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, then this site we're going to be working, Lori's site, is, I mean, you say it's one of the most prolific ankylosaur sites on the planet. I think it's got more ankylosaurs in a small area than any other site on Earth. Uh-huh. Why? Anybody's guess. But it extends really far, right? Yeah, like it's, how big, big is it's, that big, it's not as big as this site, Yeah, but it still goes for a couple of football fields. Holy cow. <laughs> so it's I'm excited size. to show everybody that, hopefully. Yeah. In, uh, it's pretty extensive, and a it's loaded with bones, too. Yeah. So you just... Start digging, and you're gonna find things. Nice, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And anyway, yeah. Let me look through the questions a bit more. Awesome thirst. Jim is the dinosaur goat, says Trappy. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest of all time. Uh, you're pretty good. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I'm good though. I got two more. That I really want to name, maybe a third. Uh-huh. You know, give me up to 25 dinosaurs. That'll be yeah. a reasonable career. <laughs> 25 new dinosaurs is pretty extraordinary. Yeah. Um, Shoot, how many new... I think I've worked at, like, maybe six sites with new dinosaurs so far. 25 is... Oh, those are 25 that you've published on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that you've named personally. Well, yeah, and some of the other authors like yeah, yeah. I, Not you bring on people papers, that yeah. know more than you. Yeah, it makes you look good. It's a collaborative process. Yeah, being, this whole science uh, thing. Afraid to work with smart people is a real stupid move. <laughs> you know, always work with the best. Yeah, I try to. By contrast, I've had one, exactly one paper that I'm an author on with a new dinosaur. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, and we had a question here. Are you a federal or state employee? I am a state employee. Yeah. The state of Utah. Serving which, at the pleasure of the citizens of Utah. Yeah. And the state of Utah had rules regarding paleo uh-huh. pretty much before almost any other state in the nation. Huh. Before the federal government really did anything. Uh huh. Well, we had another question too. Like if somebody were to find some fossils while they're out hiking or doing whatever what should they do especially if they're in utah yeah well if they're in, in utah you know certainly contact me i mean there there's a number of uh BLM officials that are you know mm-hmm. excited about what's on their land yeah you know you should get a land you know ownership map so you know, yeah so you know what kind of land you're on yeah, yeah. but yeah. if you contact me we will quickly be able to tell uh-huh. with some location data yeah if you get if gps it, readings or whatever or yeah put a point on google earth uh-huh. uh, we can tell you if it's state or federal land real quick yeah and basically i'll try to steer you in the right direction uh-huh. that's a big part of my job yeah you know is, is answering questions to the public mm-hmm. and then you know, i get usually 40 or so inquiries every month Wow, yeah, more than one a day, public, yeah. yeah. Not bad. Yeah, it's, you know, people find things and sometimes they're rocks. And yeah. Sometimes they get a dinosaur named after them. <laughs> That's a good way to put it, yeah. Yeah, shoot, what's an example of somebody who, a member of the public who found a new dinosaur and contacted you and then got it named after them? Well, let's see. I'm trying to think. That's kind of hard to put in. Oh, there you go, yeah. Yeah, Gastonia. Gastonia. He found that, I mean... He actually changed my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's there's a few. Helmut Doling, you know, leading us into this area. Mm-hmm. You know. Is it who who is something Soros Doling Eye? Is it Miras? Not Miras Soros. No, Doling Eye. It's your. Is your Gavucci a Doling Eye? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Ethan. And you know, Doling Bowl. But uh, Helmut's, you know, been. He was a second hired employee at the Utah Geological Survey. Oh, really? And he's been making ma- geologic maps at Utah for over 50 years. Is he still around? Yeah, he's still around. Shout out to Helmut Doling. Yes, he yeah. is. Slowing down a touch, but so am I. And <laughs> if, if I had his energy at his age, I'd be a very grateful person. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. 
Um, yeah. He asks, how long do you have to study to become the same thing as Jim? You mean uh, state paleontologist? <laughs> yeah, pretty much you need the PhD. Yeah. Uh, you know, though the first state paleontologist only had a master's, Jim Hudson. Yeah, yeah. But he'd worked Cleveland Lloyd for mm -hmm. over 20 years before that ever happened. So yeah, big Allosaur bone bed. Yeah. Had a lot of experience. Now Jurassic National Monument. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, and shoot, what kind of advice would you give Jim to somebody who might be watching this right now, maybe a young person? maybe a Nazi young person who wants to become a paleontologist, what kind of advice would you give them? Well, one of the things is observe the world around you. Mm -hmm. if you live in a city, go to some zoos, yeah. go to museums, live in the country, go walk along the, the creek and look at the animals, mm -hmm. draw sketches, keep a naturalist notebook. Mm -hmm. You know, is, you know, draw sketches of things. Uh -huh. Really helps distill things in your mind, that process. That's why we take notes in school. Yeah. And more than anything else, the process of writing and sketching, you know, it is cements a major, it in your yeah, mind. It cements it in your mind. Yeah. And when you're looking at something crazily complex, you look at this valley, mm -hmm. you know, you can sketch it in a much more simple way yeah. to get the, the meat out of what you're seeing mm -hmm. scientifically. So I can't recommend that enough. Hmm. You know, Keep a naturalist notebook. Yeah. Just, you yeah. know, just, it's like a diary, just what you observe. You yeah. Know, what the dog down the street did. Well, that was pretty weird. Why did you do that? <laughs> You know, but you know, observe the world around you because uh -huh. the present is the key to the past. Yeah. Uh, and if you go to when you go to college, you know, go to a school that may not be the biggest school. You yeah. Know, maybe not. You know, is, is Harvard the school you should start at? Probably not. You're probably going to be better off going to a state school with a big program. Yeah. You know, because there'll be opportunities to get involved in the field. Yeah. You know, as an undergrad, you know, you want to, and if you're really serious. You want a place that has a good biology program, good geology program, mm -hmm. and a field program you know, as paleontologist, yeah. if at all possible. Uh -huh. You know, and, and either double major or major in one and minor in the other. Geology and biology. Yeah, those yeah. two go hand in hand. Yeah. And stuff. And then the thing I always say too is like volunteer if you have the ability to. If you can start working in a museum or working with a field crew out in the field, that will open up so many doors for you and. Yeah. yeah. If you decide to go to graduate school, you know, basically keep in mind, you know, they t basically take the ones they want to work with. Yeah. You know, so if you if they you make yourself aware to people in the profession. Yeah. The chance of getting accepted, saying I like that kid to work with me. Uh huh. Uh, it's going to be a much more likely situation. University of Utah maybe like takes one student a year. Shoot. You know, yeah. Maybe two on a good year. Uh huh. And they already pretty much know who they want. And they'll have, but they'll have a couple hundred applicants, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, they're just names in space compared to someone that, you know, was out volunteering with Randy for a couple of years, yeah. you know, and, mm -hmm. and showed, you know, pluck and gumption. And uh -huh. <laughs> that's yeah. how I got into my PhD program, you know, is showing the guy that I ended up working on with my PhD, a mm -hmm. little pluck and gumption <laughs> where I was willing to disagree with him on things when I asked him questions. <laughs> And uh, you like that. Uh -huh. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah, I think I should probably start wrapping this up pretty soon here because, yeah, the site's getting nice and clean. And I uh, don't want anybody to be waiting on me. Get some of this stuff out of here. Yeah, I can start helping clean up too, so. Okay, great. Well. Let me go walk over here and thank you so much, Jim, oh. for uh, the tour of the site and everything and sharing your knowledge yeah, with everybody. There's more than the pit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. We've, we've been in this pit for like the past three weeks streaming, so it was really nice to be able to get out yeah. there and see some of the rest of the surroundings. So, appreciate that. No problem. Yeah, yeah. And with that said, go ahead and uh, get ready to wrap up the stream here. Let's see who else is live on Twitch right now. And, uh,. Yeah. We'll see if we're lucky. There'll be somebody else doing some science, and we can go raid them. But let's see. Um, there's Hoot House. Um, oh, let's go raid into Melissa in Denial, why don't we? Yeah, it's been a while, I think, since we've been in Denial with Melissa.
So Melissa is an archaeologist and Egyptologist. So she does stuff that's very different from what I do, but we're kind of kindred spirits in the same, in the sense that we like to you know, dig things up and learn about the past. So raid Melissa in denial. There we go. And we'll go see what she is up to. Will there be mummies? You bet, Heox. Yeah, she's all about the mummies. So everybody, thank you so much for uh, your attention and your questions and your enthusiasm today. Thank you for your financial support. Those of you who contributed, helped keep me on the air. Couldn't do this without you. I really appreciate it. We've got one more day of digging tomorrow, and then we're closing up the quarry tomorrow afternoon. So tomorrow will probably be my last stream from out here until September. And I'll be going back out to Lower East Side, hopefully. I gotta talk to Josh Lively about that and make sure we're all kosher. But, uh, anyway. Yeah, you take care, everybody. And let's go see what Melissa is up to. Alright, everybody. I'll see you there. Bye-bye.